Welcome to Dominica Best Presents The Deviant Mind, a true crime podcast. This is Dominica Best, your host. I have always been interested in the mind and how we and our personalities can explode, damage, hurt, and even kill the people around us. It's why I've been an avid crime fiction reader all of my life, and now I'm a crime fiction author myself. True crime has always been the basis for so much of crime fiction, because many times, true events are incredibly insightful, and also stranger than fiction. I'm not a therapist, but I do create characters for a living. I'm constantly digging deeper into what makes a person, how does their psychology drive their actions, and how do they affect the people around them? Why did they do what they did? These stories are integral to my fiction, and I'm looking forward to delving into the cases with you. Welcome to The Deviant Mind. Welcome to Episode 2 of The Deviant Mind. Today, and for the next couple of episodes, this is Part 1, I will be going into the Long Island serial killer, also known as Lisk, the Gilgo Killer, the Gilgo Beach Killer, Manorville Butcher, and the Craigslist Ripper. Now, this case still remains unsolved to this day, although there have been numerous suspects throughout the years. One of the main sources for this episode, outside of a ton of news articles, I watched several documentaries, and these will all be in the show notes. But the book that really struck me the most, and a lot of his reporting on the case, you can find online, which also will be linked in the show notes, was... Lost Girls, an Unsolved American Mystery by Robert Kolker, which was published in 2013. And in his thank yous, he said that this book would not be possible without the mothers and sisters of these women who were killed. And he goes so in-depth into these women's lives, really humanized these women through their families and friends. And I would suggest any of you true crime listeners who really care about the victims, pick up this book. It's it's fantastic. He was able to get so much access to both the families and also the investigators and the Suffolk Police Department, which definitely had some issues on this case as well. Our story begins in the barrier islands of Long Island in a narrow strip of land that is marsh, dunes, and beach. On May 1st, 2010, around 1 a.m., a black Ford Explorer driven by a man named Michael Pack followed his GPS to a small community called Oak Beach and a closed gate. He was the driver for a young woman named Shannon Gilbert. The gate was locked, but a man on the other side drove up, got out of the car, and punched in a key code to let them in. They followed him back to a house, and Shannon got out of the car. The first 911 call came in at 4.51 a.m. And this is a small aside. The police refused to release all of these 911 calls back when this happened in 2011, even though the family and the press urged them to. These calls did not get released until this year, May of this year, which is 2022. Anyway, going back to that night, the first 911 call came in at 4.51 a.m., and it lasted 22 minutes. Shannon Gilbert was the one who made this call, and she kept saying, quote, somebody's after me, there's somebody after me, there's somebody after me, end quote. I will also link for anybody who's interested to listening to these calls. It will be in the show notes. She fled from the house of Joseph Brewer, the man who she'd met at the gate to let her in, He'd hire her for that night. Shannon was an escort. We hear Shannon on the 911 call, fearful and shrieking, trying to get the help of a man named Gus Coletti after she had run out of Joseph Brewer's house. He also called 911, but he wouldn't let her into his home. He said that the only thing he could understand that she was saying was the word help. He did, in fact, call the police, and she went a-running away from him. From Gus Coletti's statements, he claimed he let her into his house, but the 911 calls say otherwise. 
he did say that he watched her through his window and saw her try to hide behind a small boat next to his house. A truck came down the road with a young Asian man in it, and Gus said he saw the girl run away into the darkness from this car. Meanwhile, Shannon had gone down another street and banged on another door. A woman named Barbara Brennan saw Shannon coming, fiddling with her phone, and heard the desperate knocking, but she would not open the door either. She told Shannon she was calling the police and called 911. Shannon again ran away from her door. Shannon was never seen alive again. The police arrived 45 minutes later after this last 911 call at around 5.15 a.m. Shannon and the car that Gus Coletti had seen were long gone. The neighbors had no idea what had happened. Who was Shannon and who was the man who let her into Oak Beach? And how does she connect to Lisk or the Long Island serial killer? The search for her body would uncover 10 bodies of women, a toddler, and a man on this remote stretch. Although many of the sources I read were a remote stretch, but I have a friend who actually lived 20 minutes from this area on Long Island, and she said that it's actually not remote at all, and that the Ocean Parkway is an extremely busy parkway with cars constantly on it. So it was interesting to talk to somebody who had actually lived in Long Island not around this time, but it has not changed much since 2010. And so she says it's not remote. The police and media f- dubbed the first four women that they found the Gilgo Four because they were found in the bramble off the Ocean Parkway on Gilgo Beach, three miles away from where Shannon disappeared. On this episode, we will discuss this and the subsequent finding of the Gilgo Four in December of 2010. Their bodies were found just three miles away from where Shannon disappeared. At first, detectives thought they had found Shannon, but they had not. The Gilgo Four consisted of Marine Brainerd Barnes, last seen in 2007, three years earlier at Penn Station in Manhattan. Melissa Bartholomew, missing in 2009 from the Bronx, Megan Waterman, last seen in a hotel in Hapwaj, Long Island, and she had gone missing in June of 2010, and Amber Lynn Costello, last seen in August of 2010 in West Babylon, Long Island. All of these women had traits in common with Shannon. They were all in their 20s and petite. They were all out-of-town escorts, and they all advertised on Craigslist and Backpage. In April of 2011, the authorities found a partially dismembered woman, another sex worker by the name of Jessica Taylor, an unidentified Asian male, two unidentified women, and an unidentified female toddler. Shannon Gilbert was found on December 13, 2011 in a swampy marsh. The cause of death was undetermined, and the police insisted that even though the search for her prompted the finding of all these bodies, She was not murdered, but instead died of the exposure. But here's the thing, and this is my own research. It was May 1st, and when I looked up the temperature, it was in a range of 52 degrees to 80 degrees. I'm not sure how she could have died of exposure, but there will be more on that in the second episode of this small series. Let's go back to Shannon Gilbert, though. Who was she? She was born in Lancaster, Pennsylvania, on October 24, 1986. Her mother, Mari, moved her and her three daughters away from her husband, who she later claimed was using heroin. They moved to Rockland County, New York, to live with Mary's mother for a bit. Shannon was the oldest with a beautiful voice and a panache for acting. Mari was independent and wanted to raise her daughters alone, and things in the family got strained when Mary or Mari, hooked up with a guy named David, who was the father to Stevie, Shannon's third sister. Mari and David had terrible fights, throwing things at each other while the kids hid. Mari's mother called the police about the violence, and David was carted off to jail. 
Shannon and her sisters were put in foster care for close to two years. Mari got the girls back and moved the family to Allenville, New York, 90 miles northwest of New York City. Shannon, unfortunately, entered the foster care system again at the age of seven, but her sisters didn't. She was living in foster homes for the next six years while having to see her sisters at school knowing they were home with their mother. She would run away from the foster homes back to her mother's place, but would eventually find her way back into the foster care system again. The author and journalist Robert Kolker wrote, Shannon's friends said she was devastated by this arrangement. Per Robert in his book, Mari, her mother, said that Shannon was the problem herself in regards to the situation. She said that her daughter was independent-minded, willful, but unstable. And Mari said, quote, a lot of mood swings, a lot of overeating, and a lot of binge and purge when it came to her daughter, Shannon. At the age of 12, Shannon was diagnosed with bipolar disorder but she never took her meds. However, in Robert's research, Shannon's sisters claimed that Shannon was sent away due to a boyfriend she didn't get along with, and this boyfriend being specifically her mother, Mari's boyfriend. When Robert spoke to Shannon's friends, they all said she was popular, talented, bright, smart, and beautiful, and didn't mention any of the traits that her mother Mari did. Her biggest problem, they also said, was that she was locked out of her own family, and that truly hurt her for the rest of her life. Shannon finally settled into a home, a foster home, that was really good for her when she was in high school, and by all accounts, Mari didn't like that. She didn't feel like she was giving the proper respect as Shannon's mother again. Some people mentioned she could have been jealous and would reappear and reassert herself into Shannon's life as her mother, causing Shannon quite a bit of distress. But of course, Shannon wanted Mari to love her and be her mother. And so she left this foster home that she was doing really well in and came back home to Mari. When she got there, Mari had turned cold and not warm like she had been when she had been living at the foster mom's house. And again, from Robert's book, Shannon, after these occasions when Mari would turn cold, would get hysterical crying, you don't want me, she'd say. These are quotes. Quote, you don't raise me, but you raise my sisters. She finally went back to her foster mother, and try to get her life back together again. She was very smart and ended up skipping a grade in high school. She did a lot of theater, which was her refuge, and her friends said that her voice made people cry when she performed. Shannon wrote poetry and essays tapping into her pain, and she graduated school a year early. She tried college and nursing school, but it didn't work out for her. She had various jobs, including at a hotel, an Applebee's senior center, and worked as a secretary at a school. She was bored, though, and didn't find much of those jobs very stimulating. Shannon decided she wanted to go to New York City to make it as a singer. She wanted to do whatever it took, be an entrepreneur, a self-made woman. But also, she wanted to help her family be a benefactor to her mother and her sisters. Then she surmised her family would love her. So she went to New York City and started working again as a secretary. And she saw a advertisement in the paper in regards to an escort service and decided to try it out. Soon after that, she quit her secretary job and went full time and worked for an outfit called World Class Party Girls at night while being enrolled in online college classes and trying to sing professionally. She headed into Manhattan for auditions during the day 
and worked for world-class party girls at night. She wanted to do whatever it took to become a singer. So the way the world-class party girls worked was that they had a client list and they had a stable of girls and drivers. So the calls would come in to the agency and then they would choose the girl and hire a driver to go and take her back and forth to the assignation. This netted everybody involved a certain percentage. So the driver would get about 20 to 25 percent and then the girl and the agency would split the rest. Now, at the beginning, when she started working, it was around two, three hundred dollars per visit with a John. But as the years went by and world class party girls really beefed up their client list with celebrities and businessmen and very wealthy people, she was able to essentially get 400 to 500 dollars for an hour and a lot of these girls would try to extend the one hour to two so a lot of time there was coke involved and different games to try to extend that hour to two hours she met the boyfriend that she was with at the time that she disappeared at that job and his name was alex diaz they moved in together in 2008 and he didn't really think that Shannon belonged working for the escort service. He didn't quite understood why she did it because she had so much going on. But she liked the money and he liked the money that she was bringing in. And after all of this, Shannon was finally able to be the benefactor for the family like she wanted. Whatever her mother Mari wanted, she'd get for her and her sisters too. And... She finally had a good relationship with her mother because of this. Unfortunately, this all came crashing down in July of 2009 when world-class party girls was brought down by the police for laundering money. At the height, the company was bringing in 250k a month and the owner of this agency, I think he was indicted for laundering about $3 million. Strangely enough, the customer list was never made public as the prosecutor wanted to use it as leverage for the trial. But the owner, which I believe was a man named Ruiz, was his last name, he pled guilty and so that client list never got out. The agency going out of business also put Shannon and Alex out of work and money. And they started to fight about what would come next. Alex didn't want Shannon to escort anymore, but he had a felony record and couldn't exactly get a normal job. And plus, what normal job would pull in the kind of money that they were pulling in working for the agency? She decided that she was going to keep on escorting because she really wanted to finish her college night classes. So she joined a different agency, but it wasn't really going well. There was lots of bogus calls and no shows. And after several months of this one night, or I guess in the morning, she came home and her and Alex got into a really big argument for the first time. And from anything I could find, this was the only time this happened. He punched her in the face and he fractured her jaw and this relationship never really got back on its feet after that and I think psychically and again this is my own opinion she seemed to change after that two months after this happened and she had to have her jaw wired shut for a bit to help with the fracture Shannon who was going under the name of Angelina at the time met a driver named Michael Pack a Korean guy from Queens, and he would be the man who would drive her to Oak Beach on that faithful night. They were frustrated with her current agency and decided that they wanted to go freelance together. She posted, and sometimes the, Michael, and she had another driver as well, would post ads on Backpage and Craigslist. She would typically pull together seven to eight jobs a night, and in between jobs, she would study for her classes. So when she would get into the car with Michael 
or this other driver, she would bring her purse, her books, and try to use the downtime the best that she could. But she was working around the clock and she was starting to get haggard. And she would sometimes around this time take about a week off to try to refill her energy levels. But again, things seemed to have psychically not gone so great for her after the domestic abuse that she suffered at the hands of Alex. And then also the fact that she wasn't pulling as much money in anymore. And so she started becoming distant with her mother and her sisters again. Alex really didn't like the fact that she was back doing it, but she insisted that she wasn't going to quit until she graduated college. On that faithful night, which was the last night in April, and then going into May 1st, 2010, she, as I said, arrived around 1.15. But before that, she and Alex had actually gone on a date to watch a movie. It was a Freddy Krueger movie, in fact, and they were having a lot of fun. But she had had a call later, and she was meeting Michael, and so they kissed goodbye, and she took the PATH train to go meet Michael. So there is not very much documentation on what happened between when Michael Pack pulled up to the front of Joseph Brewer's house and three hours later when he got a tap on his window. Now, at one point, Shannon had tasked him to go and pick up some things at CVS for her, which included KY jelly and a pack of playing cards because that would, of course, extend her hour to more like three. But otherwise, Michael was just sitting outside waiting for her until he got a tap on his window, and it was the client, Joseph Brewer, and he was saying that Shannon was refusing to leave his house and that he needed Michael's help to get her out. Michael had actually never had this kind of interaction with a John before, so he was surprised. And when he got into the house, Shannon was completely out of sorts. Shannon was afraid of him and kept talking about someone trying to kill her. He tried to cajole her out from behind the sofa to come back to the car. He kept asking her if she was okay. And this was around the time that she called 911 and started her 22-minute phone call. In the 911 call, you can actually hear Michael Pack saying, hey, are you okay? Do you want to come out now? And Joseph Brewer being like, listen, she needs to leave now. Let's get her out and trying to essentially escort her out of his house. And she did not want to. Finally, she ran out of the house, but away from the two men who supposedly were trying to help her. And then she had the encounters that I spoke about earlier with the residents of Oak Beach before she disappeared into the night. Michael Pack did search for her through the streets, but he couldn't find her, and at that point, he just left her there. When she didn't come home on Saturday, Alex, her boyfriend, was starting to get worried, and he started calling her on Sunday. So this happened May 1st was a Saturday, but we were, you know, doing the overnight between the last day of April and May 1st. And then she didn't show up all of Saturday and Alex started calling her phone on Sunday, but her phone was off. He called Michael, who was also very surprised she never made it home. Although, how is she going to make it home if Oak Beach, there isn't like a bus stop around there? She would have had to have a ride from the area where she ran off to back home. So I was a little surprised to be like, oh, wait a minute, she didn't make it home. But I guess in the moment, he told Alex where he had brought her. And so they called Joe Brewer. And he again said that he had tried to help her, but she had run off. So Alex decided to go to Oak Beach to find her. He actually talked to Joe Brewer, but he didn't get anything out of him because he said, listen, I, I tried to help her. She just kept running away, and then she disappeared into the night. Alex said, listen, I need to go to the police station. I'm going to report her missing. And so Joe actually went with him to the police station. But when they got there and explained what happened, 
and that Shannon ran off into the night and disappeared, the police pretty much laughed them off and said, she'll be back home, don't worry, maybe she just ran away. Although both of the men were like, what are you talking about? This girl was in not good shape. She was having what they thought was some sort of breakdown or fear, and they were very worried that something happened to her. So Alex left Joe, and he went back home to Jersey City, and he decided that he would file a missing persons report there. Now, he went back to Ocean Beach several times, Oak Beach, sorry, not Ocean Beach, Oak Beach several times when he went back the next day with a photo of Shannon. He was met at the gate by Dr. Peter Hackett, who was a resident at Oak Beach, and he met him at the gate and said that the community would do whatever it needed to help. And there will be more on Dr. Peter Hackett in the next episode because Mari Gilbert, Shannon's mother, filed a lawsuit against him. But that's more to come. So. There's a missing persons report filed in Jersey City. Of course, Alex contacted Shannon's mother and sisters to tell them what happened and that Shannon had disappeared. And he brought the sisters back with him to Oak Beach to canvas the neighborhoods and talk to all the neighbors to see if she could be found. Mari, Shannon's mother, decided that she was unable to come for this because she was so distraught over her daughter's disappearance. Strangely enough, Mari got a phone call during these times and she was a little bit confused as to the dates that this phone call actually happened. But she got a phone call from Dr. Hackett claiming that he had seen Shannon that night and that she was incoherent and needed help. And so he brought her into his home to take care of her, and that she was picked up in the morning by a driver. When this, of course, came out, when Shannon was not found, Dr. Hackett denied calling Mari, but when the police checked his phone records, it was proven that he actually lied about that, and I'm assuming Mari's phone number must have been on the flyers that Alex and Shannon's sisters were papering around the Oak Beach neighborhood. But unfortunately, that was that. Her family and Alex kept searching for her, and the police did some preliminary investigation, but it seems that for all intents and purposes, they dropped the ball. And I say this because there was a system of security cameras in the Oak Beach community, but the police didn't show any interest in them. These cameras would have been able to see Shannon's path that night and where she actually ran off to or who might have picked her up. The video was only stored on the hard drive for a month, according to Gus Coletti, who was part of the Oak Beach Association, and the police never asked about that within that month when they were available. They only came back eight months after Shannon had disappeared, and of course at that point, the hard drive had been erased with new video footage. The family kept trying to get the police still searching for Shannon. However, because they had no new leads, her case pretty much died. Except for an interesting fact that the Suffolk Police Department had a canine unit. This unit consisted of 22 dogs, purebred German shepherds, and each one was trained for a specialty. Open missing persons cases that had no leads were good training and practice ground for this unit. And if it wasn't for this unit, none of these bodies most likely would have been found. Officer John Malia and his canine partner, Blue, decided to search for Shannon because Officer Malia, a 31-year veteran of the police department and former private investigator, believed they were looking for a body. He did not believe that Shannon was still alive. Over the summer of 2010, they searched all of Oak Beach, even though some of the places were inaccessible because of the overgrowth of bramble and poison ivy. They came back in the fall when the vegetation had died away and started searching the southern edge of Ocean Parkway but found nothing. 
They started on the north part then, and at 2.45 p.m. on Saturday, December 11, 2010, Blue found burlap and a skeleton near the parkway of Gilgo Beach. Within two days, they had found four bodies, full skeletons all wrapped up in burlap. A curious fact to this discovery was that each body was placed about one-tenth of a mile from the next body all along the edge in a pattern. Because of the way that these bodies had been found and how meticulous it was, the police began to suspect they had a serial killer on their hands. Officer Malia and the rest of the police assumed that one of these bodies would be Shannon, and the police at that point searched Joe Brewer's house. The media descended on Oak Beach as well. Joe Brewer was defiant and said he was innocent, and both he and Michael Pack passed polygraphs, saying that they did not know what happened to Shannon and they did not kill her. A dumping ground had been uncovered, though, and the police started scouring other missing person cases, making the assumption that if one of these bodies was Shannon, then the other bodies might also be sex worker or escorts as well. The media at this point was blaring that they had a serial killer on their hands and the police from all the things I read were wholly unprepared for this kind of case. On next week's episode, I will talk about the four women who are identified as the Gilgo Four. The discovery of Shannon's remains and the other bodies found. There was a struggle by Shannon's family to have her murder investigated because the police, once all of the bodies had been uncovered, said that even though Shannon's case was the reason why all of these bodies were found, she was not in fact a victim of this killer. And they said that, as I said before, that she had died of exposure. But Mari would have none of this, and she ended up getting her own forensic pathologist to look at Shannon's remains, and she put a lawsuit against Dr. Peter Hackett, which I will go into later. This is, again, a, a very fascinating case in the way that it's evolved over the years and how pieces of information had come out. The killer had called some of the sisters of the other women, and unfortunately, there are still bodies that have not been identified to this day. They also had connected another five bodies that they're wondering if it was the same killer. Now, there is another famous killer in Long Island named Joel Rifkin, which we will be delving into in a case coming up, and he was in jail at the time that these bodies were found. The police at first thought that maybe these were bodies because they hadn't fully dated them yet that could have belonged to his victims. But when they interviewed him in jail, he said that it wasn't his. And there was definitely some speculation whether it was one killer or two killers. And we will go into that as well. So I have a feeling this case is probably going to span two or three episodes because there's so much information on the women and the strange connections between them and the suspects, because as I said, this still remains unsolved to this day. So thank you for joining me on this episode of The Deviant Mind, and stay tuned for next week as we dive deeper into the Lisk case. Thank you. This episode was sponsored by The Creek Killer, book one in the Harriet Harper thriller series written by me, Dominica Best. What would you do if you read The Police Found Your Body in a Creek? Find out in The Creek Killer, available on Amazon. Thank you for joining me and listening to this episode. If you like my show, please give me a rating and review. It helps other listeners find this podcast. Follow Dominica Best Presents The Deviant Mind wherever you listen to your podcasts. Visit thebeststorytellingnetwork.com where you'll find show notes, my books, links to social media, and much more. Join my Patreon for special subscriber perks. 
like two extra exclusive episodes a month and a Q&A with me at patreon.com forward slash the deviant mind podcast. Until next time.